In the sleepy little town of Villisca, Iowa, a house full of eight people, six of them children, were bludgeoned to death with an axe. To this day, their killer has never been caught, but that's not to say no one knows his name. Some people think the Villisca axe murders are the work of the most dangerous serial killer in history. This mystery starts on a summer night in 1912. Just after the clock struck midnight on June 10th, someone went through the Moore family home with an axe, and there were no survivors. On a Sunday night around 10 p.m., Josiah Moore and his wife Sarah were serving up milk and cookies to their kids and two little house guests before bed. The Moore kids were 11-year-old Herman, Catherine 10, Boyd 7, and 5-year-old Paul. And Catherine invited two friends to stay the night, Lena and Ina Stillinger, 12 and 8 years old. It was a jolly end to a fun day. Sarah spent weeks planning the children's day recital at their Presbyterian church. The annual pageant was a chance for the Sunday school kids to strut their stuff on stage. Parents watched their children recite Bible verses, sing songs, and play act their favorite Bible stories. Wrangling all those kids was a challenge, but it all went off without a hitch. After the final bow, the congregation got together to mingle, chat, and laugh at how cute the kids were party lasted until about 9.30 that night. And after their final goodbyes, the Moores and the Stillinger girls walked the three blocks home to cap off the day with a slumber party. None of them made it out of the house alive. The axe used to kill them was Josiah's own. Until it became a murder weapon, it was kept in the coal shed in the backyard. Strange, not one person heard their screams. When they didn't rise and shine in the morning as they normally did, one neighbor, Mary Peckham, took notice. She was up by 5 a.m. seeing to her chores. Typically, the moors would be up and about by sunrise. But that morning, the house next door was quiet. It was so unusual that she felt she should walk over and knock. But there was no answer. The house seemed to be holding its breath. It was so still. She tried the door, but it was locked from the inside. So she let the family's chickens out and went home. When 8.15 a.m. rolled around and there was still no sign of anyone, she made a call to Josiah's brother. He showed up minutes later with a set of keys to check things out. He only made it as far as the back bedroom on the first level of the two-story house. The Stillinger sisters shared that room. Their bodies lay on the bloody bed, covered with a sheet. The axe was leaning against the bedroom wall. Someone had taken the time to wipe some of the blood off of it. And even stranger was the two-pound slab of bacon wrapped in a dish towel next to it. When the marshal did a walkthrough of the house, he found death in every bedroom. All eight souls murdered in their beds. Their heads bludgeoned up to 30 times with the blunt side of the axe. Swings so violent, the axe carved out marks in the ceilings above their beds. 12-year-old Lena was the only person with the wounds to show she tried to fight back. There were no obvious signs why any of them would have been targeted. In 1912, Villisca was a small but thriving town that served as a popular stop on the railway lines that crisscrossed the country. The town had plenty of retail stores, churches, and a bustling social scene. Josiah had made his mark as a businessman, and the Moors were a well-respected part of the community and active members of the Presbyterian Church. The poor, unfortunate Stillinger girls hailed from a wealthy farming family who lived just outside of town. They were meant to be spending a night at their grandparents, but a last-minute invitation from Catherine brought them to the moors that night. Clues left at the scene added another level of bizarre. All the mirrors and two windows without curtains were covered with the victim's clothing. Superstition says if you see yourself in a mirror after a death in the house, you'll die soon too. When he was done, he apparently sat down to dinner. A plate of uneaten food sat on the kitchen table. Next to it was a bowl of blood-stained water. Did he clean up, then leave before eating? And who is the mysterious he? Only one man ever stood trial in this case, the Reverend George Kelly. By 5.30 a.m. on the morning the murders were discovered, Reverend Kelly was chugging out of town on a westbound train, and he wasn't too sleepy to chat, even though the hour was early. Passengers claimed he said he was leaving eight souls behind, a family dead in their beds back in town, except the bodies were still a few hours away from being found. If the witnesses are remembering the timing right, how would the Reverend have known? 
Two weeks later, he was still obsessed with the case. He even disguised himself as an out-of-town detective and took a tour through the crime scene with a large group of investigators. Now, he couldn't have gotten away with that in such a small town, but he'd only been there once before. On the last Sunday, the victims were seen alive. George was the son of a pair of English ministers. He came to the U.S. with his wife in 1904 and earned his living as a traveling preacher. He also had a long history of mental illness stretching back to his childhood. As an adult, he was caught peeping into windows late at night and taking an unnatural interest in young women. He even tried to start a mail-order pornography business. After the axe murders, he got increasingly more disturbed even sending out bizarre letters about the case to investigators and the victim's families. In the spring of 1917, he was arrested and spent the summer in jail waiting for his trial. While they had him close by, detectives kept questioning him, hoping for a confession. And at the end of August, they got one. He told them he was out walking late that night when he passed the Moore house and saw the Stillinger girls getting ready for bed. The way he told it, God whispered, Suffer the children to come unto me, which he allegedly took to mean kill them all. By the time his trial started in September, he had already recanted his statement. But did that mean he was actually innocent? The first jury couldn't decide. Jury number two voted to acquit him and he walked away free as a bird. What happened to him from there, we do not know. We do know that no one else has ever gotten close to a judge or jury to answer for this crime. Over the years, three major theories have emerged, but even back then, the town was split on who did it. Lots of people thought the Reverend was just a patsy for another suspect, the rich and powerful Iowa State Senator and local business owner, Frank F. Jones. I told you that no one had a grudge against the Moore family, but that wasn't quite true. Josiah was in the hardware business, what they called the implement business back then. And he worked for Frank for many years. But a few years before the murders, he struck out on his own and took the coveted John Deere franchise with him. Did Frank exact his revenge on the whole family? If he did have a part in it, folks figured he was the brains and he paid another man, William Mansfield, to be the muscle. William was a drug addict and hired hand who one investigator swore was also responsible for similar murders in Illinois, Kansas, and Colorado. In every one of those cases, the victims and mirrors were covered in the same way, meaning the same man was responsible for all of them. But it wasn't William. He managed to produce an ironclad alibi to prove he wasn't on the scene in Villisca. Was a serial killer traveling the country, taking out families with their own axes? Could be. Bill James and his daughter Rachel McCarthy James think so. They researched hundreds of cases between the late 1800s to the early 1900s, and a pattern started to emerge. If you're a baseball fan, or even a Brad Pitt fan, you might know the name Bill James. He's the guy who came up with Saber Metrics to predict how baseball teams would do. Brad Pitt's character in Moneyball uses his Saber Metrics. And in 2006, Time Magazine called him one of the most influential people in the world. Now that's all to say, he's not just any amateur investigator. They think a German immigrant by the name of Paul Mueller is the killer, and Velisca is just one of dozens of crime scenes he may have left behind. They even wrote a book about it, The Man from the Train, and in it, they describe the pattern they discovered. Paul came to America to find work as a logger and hired hand. If Bill James and his daughter are right, Paul Mueller was riding the rails between towns. He would hop off, find a job or two to make some quick cash, and target a family living near the train depot. All the victims were bludgeoned with the blunt side of the axe, then left covered with sheets or clothing. And after Paul left the country, another infamous axe murder case happened in Germany in 1922, the Hinterkaifeck family killings. Everybody in the household, from the baby to the father, and even the maid, was killed with an axe and their bodies were left covered, just like the case in Villisca. It too has never been solved. Paul Mueller may have been the worst serial killer in history, and he was never caught. Who do you think is responsible for the Velisca Axe murders? 
And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.